just about to start the Brandon Badges How Fedora Designers Create with Inkscape talk with wonderful Marie and Jess here. So um, we're going to have a few questions in the middle, but I will turn off my camera and let you guys take it away. I'm really excited for this. Awesome. Thank you, Madeline. Um, I'm Marie Norton, and here with me is Jess and me organizers for this Creative Freedom Summit. Um, so we're really excited to be able to share with you. Um, and Jess is going to be kicking it off today. Cool, so hi everyone. Um, so we're gonna be talking about the brands part first, uh, which is my section. So um, so just a little bit about me first. So um, I'm currently a Fedora, uh, oh, excuse me. I'm currently a Fedora Community Design intern. Um, working with Red Hat uh, based in Ireland and um, I've been here for for only a year so my my knowledge of Inkscape is is it's at a good level um, so um, I've worked on many projects in the um, in the Fedora community such as the Fedora brand book um, and also the Fedora brand guidelines that well we're turning the book into a website at the moment so I'm working on that too and um, we also have the Nest Flock and Hatch logos. As you can see there, there's one of the logos um, there that I I worked on. And uh, also logos like the Fedora Mentor Summit that you can see there and the Fedora Gaming uh, logo as well, as well as our new mascot, Color. So did a lot of stuff. <laughs> so um, yeah, and again, working with Inkscape, uh, doing a bit of blender learning and all of that stuff so uh, so in this talk I'm just gonna talk about some things in Inkscape um, that uh, um, I found useful during my um, my internship here and um, and things that I've learned along the way so we'll start off with the Fedora Gaming um, logo and for this one I use the power stroke feature uh, which is a really cool feature. Um, so when creating the Fedora gaming logo, I wanted to keep the look of the original hot dog that we have. Like it looks very hand drawn. And um, so we wanted to recreate that in the vectorization of the logo because the original drawing, I think I think it was drawn in Krita. So we wanted to do some stuff like that. So Mo, you've probably seen her, Maureen, uh, she introduced me to this uh, feature called the pair stroke feature, which is a really good way of um, portraying that hand drawn feature. Um, so it gives tapered ends um, at the ends of uh, different strokes. And um, another option is the taper stroke as well, but I feel like with the, um, with the pair stroke feature, you can kind of manipulate it better. Um, the taper stroke is very kind of one-sided. So whereas the, um, the power stroke feature has like these little pink nodes on the edge. So like take my finger, for example. So like there'd be a pink node here that you can stretch it up and down. But with the taper stroke, you have your node here and then there's a node kind of in the middle and you can drag that up and down um, in regards to like if you want it thicker, if you want it thinner or if you want it like a round ed edge uh, at the top. So in the next video, um, in the next slide, I have a little video of um, this feature. So I just wanted to show it in action because uh, it's better, better to see it. Um, so I went into the path effects tab and you can actually get this by clicking path and path effects. And you can see the little nodes there, just pulling them in and out and you can create the different shapes and um, yeah, reshape the stroke into a tapered line and even on one side rounder than the other side pointy, whichever uh, you prefer. So yes, yeah, so that's the power stroke feature. So for the Fedora Mentor Summit, um, we created this like little Venn diagram-esque uh, logo with a little light bulb to, um, I suppose, symbolize, you know, two people coming together, creating really cool ideas. Um, and that's all that mentorship is about. So, with this, I originally wanted for the um, the two circles when they intertwine to kind of, you know, have that transparency effect. So I originally used, you can use like um, 
the opacity slide on Inkscape. And we try to use that, but thinking about it for like printing and stuff, it doesn't really like it won't come out as good. Like it's best to have like three solid objects rather than have one object solid and then the other one transparent. So um so yeah, having three solid objects with no transparency effects would just make printing a lot easier. Um, so the tools I used for this was the union difference and intersection path tools. So these are basically like cutouts. Um, and uh, so I used the, um, uh, so like the intersection tool, I use that to create the center part of the diagram. So you literally just get the two circles, put them together and then whatever's on the top, it cuts it out at the bottom. So it's kind of like a cookie cutter effect. And then I also use that the same method in the actual light bulb itself, like for the, the little F looking um, element in the light bulb, I literally just turned it from stroke to path and then and right -click, or right -click both. And then you do the difference and it just cuts that squiggly shape into that light bulb shape that I made. And it's the same with the, the bottom too. So this is a little demo. So the union tool, then you select the two shapes and you go to path and union. Um, and it just combines the two shapes together. Um, and whatever is underneath it, it takes that. Uh, so the different the difference tool, so so whatever's on top acts as the cookie cutter and just cuts out from the bottom. And uh, then same with the intersection tool, it's the reverse of the difference tool. So whatever is um, whatever is actually underneath the uh, the orange circle in this case actually gets cut out. Um, the exclusion tool is kind of cool. Um, it takes away whatever is like overlapping and just leaves the other two there. And then the difference tool is like a mis a mishmash of the difference tool and intersection tool. And you have the two little bits that um, it cuts out the two shape shapes, but it doesn't delete them. It just separates them too. So you can work with both of them. So in the next one then, so we have the next, the nest flock and hatch logos. And this feature that I learned from this was using text as a logo type base. So I originally sketched up these uh, logos by um, drawing them first. So I used uh, Comforta as uh, the base type. The font is the base uh, for this logo, along with the flock and hatch. And then when sketching out the designs first, um, what I did with the original was I actually imported my sketch into Inkscape and I got a really thick, like I used the pen tool and I got a really thick stroke and uh, drew them out, which is totally not the way to do it. Um, so, so then what we did instead is actually, Marie helped me out with this a lot uh, since she has a lot of experience in creating logos. And uh, we did a little workshop and um, what I learned from that was to actually use the, the logo type. And if you select it and go to path, and then it's um, object to um, object to path. Each letter becomes its own individual like object. So you can like manipulate the nodes however way you want. And that's how I created the um, like on the N. You see, there's like a little gap. So what we did was we actually duplicated the N. We took a little section off of the um, like the very like the foot of the N basically. And uh, we cut that off. We kind of, we put it in where the tail meets the, so like you have the end here, it's probably going to be mirrored. I don't know which way, but um, so you have the stem of the end and then the curve bit. So we just separated them two and then added that little foot just to create the round bit. And uh, same with the E and the T as well. And then we added the, um, the little tree then. So again, with the freedom, yeah. So this is just me um, bringing the object to pass um, thing to to reality, and then it just shows you. Then you can manipulate the nodes. And what's nice about this as well, you can actually get the pen tool, and whatever node you've selected, you can actually extend that. And that's how I made the little um, tree on the um, 
on the T on the Nest logo. So and also you can do that or you can actually just draw it and then um you can select two and do the union and then they all become one piece. So then for Chlore, I learned how to use the gradient mesh. So sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so sorry. So um uh, so the gradient mesh consists of nodes and arrows that let you control the blend. So it's basically, it's like a massive grid and um, you can just plot your different colors that you want to use. Um, I have here, I have to be careful when trying to blend colors. I mean, it's it's like basic color theory, like, uh, well, especially with the orange and the, the um, green that I used, of course, they don't really mix together. So they kind of look, well, at the start, it looked kind of brown, like a really muddy color. It wasn't that great. So again, just like adjusting it with the little arrows, you can move it around. Um, so, and I want it to be really colorful as well. And because uh, when I originally drew it out, I um, I was like sketching, sketching it and blending it in um, in Kurta and um, doing it that way. So, and I wanted to create the same feel with the gradient mesh. So this is just me um, messing around with it with a circle. Um, so again, once you select it, then you can use the different nodes. Um, like, especially in the bottom where the green is, you can see that there's a node there. You can click on it and change the colors. Then this is me just messing around with the arrows. So you can see how you can change the direction of the gradient, which is really nice. Um, and if you like, Put the arrows in a certain way so that they overlap you can actually make a line in the gradient which you'll see at the end but again you can like do make little shapes and kind of manipulate the the gradient to where you want it to be and it's quite nice as well to have that bending um motion so that you can um if you if you're doing like a 3d effect on a sphere or something oh yeah it's me don't mind that <laughs> and um so yeah, this is what I meant by creating the line. So when I deselect it at the end, you can see there's a line there. So, and the last bit I'm gonna talk about is the multi-page feature, which was recently introduced into Inkscape and it is my favorite thing ever. I love having multiple artboards on um, an Inkscape design. So um, yeah, so use the, the multiple page, the multi-page feature to organize the brand book and it was really helpful when exporting the pages uh in the video afterwards i'll show you but um it's it's really nice you can just select batch export and um pages and it just exports everything and it was really nice to keep everything organized as well and it's really nice especially if you if you want to work on like multiple logos on the one like Inkscape file rather than have many Inkscape files. It's really nice to organize it uh, that way as well. So we'll move on then to the video. And this is just me showing how I used it for the Fedora brand book and um, just um, sectioning out the pages. And um, so this is me just going into a new file and then you have the page there. And um, but you can also add pages with the um, the page tool. So create a new page. It'll immediately make another A4, but you can resize it. And there's different, like in the drop down beside that, there's different um, page types you can pick. You can rename your pages. So like I have cover page here. So that's a single image export. So you can switch between the pages, but the batch export is where the magic happens. It's so good. So you can select whichever pages you want and uh, you can export them. You can actually export one page as two separate files. So let's say for the front page of the brand book, I can export that as a PNG to put into a PDF, but I can also export it as an SVG if I ever wanted to have separate SVGs for some reason, but it's, it's handy for logos as well if you if someone requests like a specific logo um you can export that one out of your big um inkscape files so yeah so this is my section of of the talk 
um done so uh i'll take we'll do a little break for questions if that's okay so yes we have some that have come in <gasps> so the first one is is the fedora brand guidelines maybe public it would be nice to have a look on it yes they are public uh we have a gitlab for them uh i can share that after this actually um, next question is, hi everyone, great presentation. I wanted to ask what sources, like videos, courses, online material would you recommend for newcomers to learn more about Inkscape? Thank you. Ooh, um, well, with my learning experience, I was just kind of all self-taught and going back to like Mo's my, um, my mentor. So a lot of going back and forth to her, but I find, I know, I know it's kind of a proprietary software, but YouTube is your your best friend when it comes to these things, um, especially since they're all free uh, to access. Um, and yeah, like I'd say YouTube was like my main priority. Like if I didn't get something, I'd just Google it or YouTube or any kind of form even as well. So. Um, and I'll say that, like, I think as members of the design team, we're all really willing to answer people's questions if they're ever in the design team element, like chat room. But yeah, YouTube's a great place. And then um, my own question was, <laughs> as you were showing all of the kind of uh, tips and tricks and, you know, stuff that I'm familiar with, but I often have a hard time remembering, like, sometimes I'll be trying to exclude something or exclude something and then I choose the wrong one. And I was like, I wonder if we could come up with a mnemonic device for remembering <laughs> like <laughs> certain groups of features in Inkscape that like, I don't know, it'd be kind of a fun, catchy thing. So I don't know, something to consider. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I suppose like different colors and finding yeah. it that way. Cause I, I find it difficult too sometimes like, was oh, the layer meant to be above or below? Mm -hmm. And which one do I select? <laughs> I think, yeah, when I'm clipping something, it's like, oops, I've selected the wrong thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, great so far. And I, I'll let you know at the end if any other questions come in for you guys. Perfect. Um, I suppose one thing as well uh, that I'd like to mention too is um, the, with the multi-page feature as well, there's um, one thing that uh, it'd be really cool if there was like a PN like you can export all pages as like one PDF. Um, but yeah, I love, I love things. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I'll move on to Marie to talk about badges then. So. Thank you, Jess. Um, I wonder if that's an option already or we could put a feature request in or maybe Martin knows the answer if he's with us in chat. Um, cool, so today I'm gonna talk about badges. Um, this is less of a, this is how to use Inkscape tool and more of a, this is how Inkscape has made the Fedora community better and stronger and um, improved our culture over many, many years. So just a tiny bit about me. Um, I started with badges design and now I'm here. Um, I work at Red Hat as a code of conduct specialist doing code of conduct work and consulting, but you might know me as the Fedora Project's former F-Cake. So I worked as a community architect in the Fedora Project for the past three years, recently moved into a code of conduct role. Um, I was introduced to open source in 2013. So just shy of 10 years ago, um, a shout out to Outreachy, an amazing mentorship program, and of course, Maureen Duffy, my mentor, and many other ment uh, a mentor for many other people um, in the Fedora design team. Um, I'm also an artist, designer, and maker. You can see some of my things here on the right side, some drawings, some dot paintings, um, some calligraphy and book binding. Um, so just thought I'd share that with you as well. So Fedora badges, if you don't know what they are, I'm just gonna give a quick introduction to that. They're a huge part of the Fedora project culture. So 
that sub, sub project was initiated in 2013 before I came on. Um, and the main goal of badges is to recognize contributions to the Fedora project. It's a gamification system basically to give ourselves that hit of dopamine and serotonin and make it even more fun and exciting to um, be a part of the Fedora community. So the back end is built with Terrier and Fedora messaging. Um, we have some automated badges that connect up to our Fedora systems and that's made possible using YAML. Um, but the point that I want to talk about is that dozens and dozens of artists have contributed to creating badge art. At this point, we have 600 plus badge designs and there are requests for probably about 100 or 50, 150 more um, that aren't even uh, created or haven't been able to be automated at this point. Um, so there's six main categories that we award badges for, and that's content, development, quality, community, events, and miscellaneous. We needed a miscellaneous because there's just always those things that come up. But here's a social panda badge that I designed for uh, joining a Fedora virtual social. So back when badges all started, there were some design goals for you know, what we wanted it to be, right? So we wanted it to be fun and friendly, um, basically tying back to that friends foundation in the Fedora project. So we wanted to use that Fedora color palette, which would tie back to Fedora's brand and also keep the tones kind of lighter, um, some kind of pastel colors to keep it kind of airy and fun and fresh, right? So we don't have people represented in uh, the badges as humans, we have them represented as animals. So that was another way that we keep it very fun and friendly. Um, so we have pandas in there and people ask where the pandas came from. And I will tell you, it's Mo, I think. Um, <laughs> and we also have badgers, snakes. Um, I'm sure we'll see Kalor popping up in there now that we have a new mascot. Um, and back when this all started, Comforta was like the main Fedora type typeface that we used. At this point, it's been deprecated um, for use in a lot of Fedora designs, but we've held on to it here because it kind of embodies still that fun and friendly look. And we also have that as a basis for some of our other logos, like the Nest logo that Jess was talking about. So we've, we've held on to it in the badges space. So here you can see like the anatomy of a badge. We have an outer ring that denotes what category it, it falls in, background color, there's usually a pattern of some kind, and then on the top of that lays a graphic. So I wanted to showcase the creativity um, of our designers, and these are all designed by pretty much different people. I think we have a few, a few you know, mashups uh, with multiple contributors, but here you can see we have a similar look and feel across all different badges with all different artists um, and the creativity that we've been able to express through badges as a Fedora design team over the years has been um, a really fun part of being a part of Fedora and being a part of the badges project. As you can see, we kind of have cultural references in here. Um, and just, you know, kind of fun depictions of, you know, this one we're testing Fedora Core OS. So, um, or this one I think is for the community outreach re revamp. So people all over the world working together. This one was for a social at a, at a flock event, I believe. So some really, really cool art and a chance to make art um, with each other. We've also spent a lot of time passing on uh, knowledge about Inkscape and badges and Fedora culture with design workshops at both Flock, our in-person conference, and Nest with Fedora, our virtual conference. So all the way back in 2014, I gave a presentation on the internship I did with badges. And then after that, I started giving badge design workshops so that I could add more artists into the fold uh, and you know, create more badge designs in general. Uh, in Flock 2019, we had a hack fest and that merged 
the designers and the developers together to try to improve the system overall. Um, we, you know, COVID happened and things slowed down on that, but we still managed to do some um, more workshops and presentations at our virtual event. This year is the Badger Padawan badge, and that is for uh, participating at a workshop, a badge design workshop. So very excitingly and very full circle, I was able to mentor a badges intern over this last summer. I co-mentored with Smerigol. We um, interned an amazingly talented young woman, Nikita Tripathi, and we had some goals for this internship, right? So we wanted to modernize the badge template. Um, wanted to give it, you know, keep the same feel, but update the look a little bit. We wanted to update the style guide because things had changed. It was like 10 years or nine years since we had last made a version of the style guide. And then also over the years, there were things that kind of slipped through the cracks. Like we had files exported at the wrong size, or maybe we just needed to push a, a piece of artwork through because we needed it for an event or something else. And maybe those didn't fit all of the guidelines that we had in place. So here's an example of a revamp, you know, adding the new logo in, using the new template, which I'll show a little bit more in a moment. Um, and just making sure that it's kind of following these up-to-date style guides. So this is what I was talking about here. Basically, we move from this design to this design. So this is a bit more focused on the graphic. It's simpler, it's dark mode compatible. Um, and it also, in the original design, there was some, um, if you get real close in there on the nitty gritty, there's a little bit going on with the vectors. They're not entirely smooth. So we cleaned those up and it's visually balanced. So along with that, we created new templates. So we have template files to create badges. So that kind of just was six templates. You get an event template, there's nothing in there. You're just kind of starting from scratch, right? So now what we have is instructions in the template. We have type B uh, samples in the template. We also have patterns, sample graphics, um, and basically a clip so that the artwork is just staying in that badge area instead of kind of wandering off. Because we do have you know newcomers and people who are new to Inkscape working on this. So we wanted to make it um, as easy and simple for them to get into designing badges. So we also went with um, an update of the style guide. So we wanted to modernize the style guide. This is the one I um, created in 2013, 2014. And here is the one that Nikita has updated um, just this past summer. So it kind of has a slicker look, updated, uh, colors for the new Fedora um, logo color. We have some more recommendations for how to pair the colors together. And I, this is like a 30 page um, style guide. So this is just one page of it. I wasn't gonna go through um, the entire thing, but very excited to use that. So if you go to Fedora badges right now, you'll probably notice that the new style guide isn't there. And there's a couple of reasons for that. So Fedora Badges is in the process of getting an overhaul. There was just a meeting yesterday for um, the redo of Fedora Badges. I forget what the name of the meeting is called, but it's a group of us from um, the community platform engineering team, people from the community, people from the Fedora design team coming together to redo the badges site. I mentioned a little bit of that technology that was behind Fedora badges. And the truth is it's out of date and some of it is no longer maintained. So it's been kind of a question for a while of, you know, how can we keep this up to date? How can we keep this modern in a way that people want to contribute to the back end and front end of the Fedora badges website? Um, 
So what's going on right now is exploration, development, and implementation of a new backend and front end of Fedora badges. Um, we want to implement that new badge template on 600 plus badges. <laughs> You'll see I put like a shocked face here because it's going to be a lot of work. Um, we want to apply the style, style guide to all the current artwork, so making improvements. Um, and we also, along with that, kind of need to know the requirements of what that new website will look like, right? So we built our template based on the specifications for this current website. So it has like a certain amount of padding in it. And for the new website, we don't know exactly what those will be. So the reason that we don't have that new template um, implemented is because we're, you know, working with the developers to make sure that we're doing it right the first time. We don't want to have to, um, redo 600 badges and then redo 600 badges again um and we are looking for people to contribute you know people who are already in the fedora community newcomers um and we need all different types of people uh with different skills and you can be a complete newbie um in any of these areas to to contribute to this right so we need back-end developers front-end UI and UX designers slash developers. We need illustrators. We really need illustrators. Um, we need people who can do communications and want to do communications. So making sure we're getting input from the community, uh, talking about the work that we're doing. Um, and we also need project managers. So people who can make sure we are on track and we are um, adapting to the changes as things happen and maybe we bring new people on, where do they fit into the picture? Um, so we really need all different types of people to make this implementation um, of the new site and the new artwork. And over here is the master badge artist. This is if you've designed over 100 badges, I think. Um, I also just wanna say thanks to the many Fedora designers. Um, we've had so many people contribute to Fedora badges over the years. Way more than this list, but it's kind of hard to keep track of everybody. So I, I got, I went to the artwork log and I found, you know, the people who had contributed at least a handful. Um, so thank you so much for your work on Fedora badge design over the years um, and making something really awesome um, that's, at the heart of the Fedora community. So cool. Thanks for attending. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, and so then I can actually take a look at the chat too. Yeah, we've got, I think, two questions for you guys. Um, so okay, cool. the first question is, in some cases, choosing between Inkscape and Penpop for a certain graphic design project could be difficult as both may be suitable. How do you decide which one you work with per project? Do you have a standard um, for this? And are there any decisive factors you follow when choosing either one or the other? I have a quick answer for this, but I'm, I'm also curious, Jess and Madeline, what you think about this. Um, I am primarily like an illustrator, like design logo designer so I'm not doing a lot of like you know front end development so mm. I haven't done a ton with pen pot so far Me too. is like <laughs> my home like my bread and butter um and you know a piece of software that I've been using for so long it's like you know second nature to me so my first instinct is usually to go to Inkscape but I think that there's a lot of tools in PenPot that um, are important for other use cases. So I think it depends on what you, what you're trying to accomplish. That's my input. I agree. And the the question asker kind of said like they were thinking an example like a presentation could be both designed in Inkscape and PenPot, um, and that a digital brand book might be a bit easier to design maintain in pen pot than inkscape um and i think it um a big part for me is also just like i'm more comfortable in inkscape um and you can usually bring i think that 
most of the time, any vector work that you're doing in uh, Inkscape, you can bring into PenPot and then vice versa. So it like doesn't matter all the time, but like PenPot has libraries, so it's great. I don't know, you go Jess. <laughs> yeah, I think Marie and Madeline, you both said what was on my mind as well. And like PenPot is really great, I think for more so the front end as well and user testing and like what, um, what um, Emma and uh, Ashlyn, yes. <laughs> uh, like what they were talking about yesterday about using um, PenPot to create the Fedora websites. Like I I think it's, it's a much better tool for that. Like personally, um, design wise for me, it's 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 Inkscape all the way, and what's nice about Inkscape as well the the way you can transfer a project from Inkscape into PenPot no problem because it takes SVG format as well. Like I've used PenPot as well for like the libraries too and updating the libraries with like the different um, the different characters and logos and stuff like that. So I suppose like how I use PenPot is more so maintaining it for others to use it if that makes sense. So I have a question, Jess, because I think I remember this coming up, but is there um, an issue with pen pot and gradients? Yes. Yeah, so if you import the, S the SVG, so like say take Color for example, like when we were trying to import him into it as an SVG, um, the gradient mesh on his belly wouldn't import. So we have to import it as a PNG. We haven't figured out why that is. I suppose it's the same as well. If you just click on an SVG and open it in an image viewer as well, it doesn't display the gradient mesh. So I don't know if it's the, SV the SVG format or if it's PenPot itself. So we're still trying I to say figure that out. When Pablo was talking on, I guess that was Tuesday that we brought that up. We're like, we want it great. So maybe <laughs> that'll be a soon, soon to be feature. Yeah, Hopefully. fingers crossed. The next question is, when is the next badge workshop? <laughs> hmm. So, uh, when we were first planning this Creative Freedom Summit, it was I think I was calling it the Fedora Design Week, and like we were considering like just trying to work on fedora design for a week and then we said like no actually it would be better to share with others our knowledge instead of trying to make this internally focused so one of the things that i wanted that i was thinking about for that like previous idea was to do a badge sprint so i think one potential time could be flock or nest or whatever's happening for fedora's conference contributor conference in 2023 so you know whatever whenever wherever that is um i'd love to see a fedora badges design workshop but you know life is life i don't know if if it's in person i'm not sure if i'll make it to be honest you know like the world is kind of a crazy place right now so um I'd like to participate and be hands-on for implementing that new template. So I'm also considering doing a sprint, a virtual sprint where we all kind of work on badge designs for maybe a week or something like that. Um, I'm also talking with Samara, who I mentioned earlier about mentoring another badge intern for this upcoming summer to do all the work. <laughs> Not all, but a lot of the work of moving that the artwork from that old template into the new template. So there's a couple of things we have um, that we're looking at for 2023. Um, but, you know, maybe one of those things that the intern could work on was, you know, coordinating a sprint. Right. And we could kind of put that in put them in charge of that and they would get a taste of, you know, community building and community organization alongside, you know, the design work. Brilliant. Um, I think that's a really 
something to look forward to. Um, and the last question we have is, I tried to do a badge like forever ago. What does happen? What happens on those cases? Do they get reassigned or just lost in time? I think aside from the design part, that part of the flow could be improved too. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to take partial credit or blame for this. Um, I think I mentioned it a couple of times now, but uh, COVID made life pretty hard there for a while. I had a new job that was a challenge, you know, working as Fedora's Community Action and Impact Coordinator. Um, and that was my first job in community management. So I was learning a lot, doing a lot. So I wasn't able to put as much time and energy into badges basically since 2019. So um, I think what needs to happen is a triage of that repo and to kind of go back in and make sure, um, you know, people are getting responses. I have stopped filtering the badges <laughs> emails out of my inbox because uh, as FK, your inbox is a little bit wild. Um, so I'm seeing those notifications. I'm uh, very involved now in this overhaul. I'm going to co-captain the design part with um, Emma Kidney. So I plan to be much more involved in the badge design stuff. You know, being in a new role, I now have some more space. And of course, it's demanding. But now working on Fedora can kind of be my hobby again, um, whereas before it was my full-time plus um, paid job, day job. So, you know, with all the other needs that I was fulfilling for Fedora, it was a bit hard to also do badges at the same time. Well, I'm glad that it is not going to be as overwhelming anymore for you and for other people who want to contribute. Um, and that is it. I don't think there's any more questions. You guys gave such a great presentation. It was so great to see all those tips and the history of the badges laid out. Bye. Bye.